Hola, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we are in Acts chapter 11, and we want to talk about things like trances and visions, updating the paradigm. I want to look at what the early Christians, in this case, they're all Jews, they're all of the circumcision, except for Cornelius, what they did to react to getting new novel information um, with... An, and this new novel information included things, information being transmitted through visions and trances. And, you know, me coming from a Baptist background, that's typically frowned on. And that's, uh, <clears throat> why is that frowned on? <laughs> Make sure you got some coffee. It seems that from my background, and when I say my background, it doesn't mean that I'm there now. I'm in explore mode now. And uh, hopefully we'll stay there. But from my background, when something wasn't understood or wasn't controllable, people feared it. And so then everything that was feared or couldn't be controlled or wasn't understood was relegated to the bucket of bad. It's demonic. It's and also something that um, couldn't be regulated and couldn't be validated. And that's one of the problems with subjective experiences, that they're hard to validate, they're hard to regulate. <clears throat> if somebody has a vision or they're seeing Jesus or an angel or something like that, there's, there's really no way for anybody else to tell whether or not that's really authentic or whether or not it's... Uh, there's, there's different kinds of authentic. First of all, are they making it up? Second of all, did they really see a thing? And if they did really see a thing, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And then that's where discernment comes in. So there's so many unknowns that it is, it is a lot easier to just relegate such things to the realm of bad. Put it in the bad bucket. That's demonic. Put it in the demonic bucket. bucket. We'll put it over there. <laughs> and I don't think that that's the way we should be handling things. And I notice that this kind of spreads out into other domains. As I have been on my journey of escaping the ideological possession of my past, I've noticed that there are things that are good, that are part of creation, that are within the capabilities of mankind, that seem to be something God wants us to incorporate, and there are scriptural uses for it, scriptural uh, basis for it. But at the same time, because it's not well known, because it can't be controlled, because it's feared, because it's not understood... It gets relegated to the domain of bad and it gets associated with things. Oh, that's what you, that's the same thing the New Agers say or the Buddhists say or the emergent church says. And the people will try to map you to negative people and try to make everything that they can't control, or they don't understand, or that they fear, they make it all bad. They make it all evil. They make it all something to avoid. And I think we do that. We, when I say humans, humanity, I think. Uh, in-groups tend to do that naively, ignorantly, and prematurely. We relegate things to being bad, kind of as a safety mechanism. It's like, since I don't understand this, I'm just going to avoid it. And I'm going to give everybody else reasons to avoid it because I can't control it. it. You know, I can't help but think of M. Night Shyamalan's movie, The Village. If you have not seen The Village, that is... Uh, a good piece of literature to understand. I think the Logos is trying to say something through that. You cannot avoid reality. And I'm not going to spoil that movie if you haven't seen it. But it's a good way to interact with literature. Um, there's The Logos tries to tell you things in a variety of cases. And I think that's that story in the movie The Village. They have some things there. They're afraid of. And so they just take it all off limits, you know. In a typical in that Shyamalan fashion, you have a, a, a reveal at the end, which kind of gives you the, the grandeur and the scope of what they were hiding. I don't want to have a kind of faith or religion that is based on hiding and restricting things, okay? So what we do is we typically, what when I say we, typically Christian in-groups tend to put propositional boundaries on things that that would be your statement of faith or your systematic theology or your church's bylaws or your church's constitutions will put propositional boundaries on things and then 
all the leeway that we have to operate and interoperate and respond to stimuli and respond to novelty um, must it's considered safe to be within that do things that are only mentioned within that statement of faith or within the accepted systematic theology or within the confession of faith, something like that. And there is no leeway or tolerance or anything like that for things that operate outside of that paradigm of that way of thinking. But we know <clears throat> that there are things that occur outside of that those propositional boundaries. Now, that happens in real life, too. Say, so what do you mean? There are things that happen in the medical industry. There are things that happen. There are paranormal things that happen. Um, anything from, well, I'm just going to say there's paranormal things that happen. They happen often and frequently enough and with a good enough degree of similarity between different accounts that we know that something is happening, but we do not yet have the tools to measure certain things because they are so subjective. Okay, to objectively measure things, like catch things on camera, and sometimes things are caught on camera. Um, but those kinds of things, things where everybody agrees that the paranormal thing is not. So we have, we don't really have any paradigms, any secularized paradigms that people who consider themselves scientists would accept that account for paranormal activity. Therefore, there is no official story on it, and everyone interprets it in accordance with whatever they're used to in accordance with their religion, their tradition, that kind of thing. There is no official narrative on these paranormal things because uh, there is no objective way to measure whether or what the things are so that we can incorporate them into some kind of paradigm. So that happens in the religious world too. That happens in the faith world too. Now the problem isn't when things happen outside the paradigm. The problem is having a paradigm. That's the problem. Having a paradigm is the problem because... It takes you out of explore mode and it gives you a false sense of security and a false sense of comfort because we crave certainty and because we, because someone's telling us we have it, here are the answers. We think that we are safe and comfortable in having these answers, but there are things that are happening that are unaccounted for in the paradigm. I am curious about what those are. I don't like there to be things that are unaccounted for in the paradigm. Therefore, um, I'm not completely against a paradigm altogether, but I think a paradigm ought to, ought to be very fluid, very fluid, constantly updatable with very little bureaucracy in the updating process. <clears throat> and maybe so fluid that we don't even write it down. Maybe that fluid. I'm saying maybe, throwing these ideas out there. If you like this kind of content, remember to support the channel. This content is brought to you by people who support the channel. Details to do so are in the description below. Remember, we're not following anybody else. We're not following the gated institutional narrative of any church, denomination, statement of faith, creed, uh, confession of faith, seminary, systematic theology. We're not doing any of that. We're not doing any of that. We're exploring the Bible, fresh and in an open sense, to see what it says for ourselves. That's the journey that we're on. We invite you, I invite you, and we, those of us on Wednesday nights, and those of us who support the channel, we invite you to join us on this journey of exploring Scripture to see what it says for yourself. In Acts 11, <clears throat> They had just done the Cornelius thing. Cornelius is, remember so far, they're only, uh, where's my little meter here? I don't have my little meter. I don't like that. They're only preaching to Jews. Notice what's happening in Acts eleven nineteen, when After Acts 8, when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to Jews only, so they're only preaching to Jews. Nobody's preaching to any Gentiles. I know the Great Commission's already there. Jesus says, go preach the gospel to every creature. I got it. But they're not doing that, okay? They're thinking everyone needs to become a Jewish proselyte first, and then they can accept the, G the Jewish Messiah. So they're seeing this as a very Jewish thing. So when they, when they say to none but to Jews only, that is ethnic, ethnic Hebrew Jews who were born into Judaism, and then people who converted to Judaism called proselytes. 
So prior to this time, when you see a place where it says the Hebrews and the Grecians, um, there was a dispute like back in Acts 6, they're Jews religiously, they're proselyte. The Grecians are Jews because they proselyted to Judaism. Okay, So that kind of thing is going on. So they're preaching to none but to Jews only. And remember the controversy. We've gone over this many, 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 many times. In Acts chapter 15, there's people preaching that you have to keep the law and be, and, uh, be circumcised in order to be saved. That is the mentality. That is the default baseline mentality. And here in Acts chapter 10, you have somebody who is not a proselyte, who is not circumcised, who's not keeping the law of Moses. But... And he hears the gospel and gets the Holy Spirit showing he can be saved. And they deduct from that in Acts chapter 15, verse 9 through 11, that God purifies the hearts through faith, not through the keeping of the law or being circumcised. And you could even argue, like, including baptism, for that matter. So when Peter comes up and uh, this, they of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them? But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying... And then he tells the story. So these guys are contending with him. Like, what do you think you're doing? You're breaking the rules. Peter basically says, I have a good reason to break the rules and the rules are changing. Listen, if you keep going in the narrative, you will find out. When they heard these things, look at their response. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life. That is a propositional statement. That is the same kind of propositional statement that you might find written down in somebody's statement of faith. God has granted repentance unto the Gentiles. The, um, <laughs> the Calvinists try to use this verse to say that God must grant repentance before you can repent. Trying to say that it must be granted individually on an individual basis and he's basically what they really mean is that he's withholding it from everybody by default and then grants it by exception to some people like to what they call the elect but if you're a bible believer and a bible reader you see that god has granted to the gentiles repentance to life are you a gentile okay then repentance to life has been granted to you there it is you don't what that means is that you don't have to keep the law or be circumcised to be saved. That's what that means. The mindset before this, and you should put markers in your Bible, Acts 15, 31. When Peter is talking in Acts 5 to a Jewish audience, he's talking about Jesus, and he says, The God of our fathers who raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung on a tree, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So if you are in Israel, you have repentance given, given to you. Does that mean that everybody in Israel has it repented, has, is repenting? No, but it is granted to them. Okay? <clears throat> if you were to use the negative inference fallacy right there, the same way the Calvinists do to try to prove limited atonement everywhere else, you would have to use this verse to say that nobody else can get saved. And guess what they were doing? That's... That's exactly how they saw it. They saw that nobody else, nobody, you had to be a proselyte or, or a natural born Jew. Had to be of the Jewish religion in order to be saved, to get the repentance. And uh, this, this repentance was with regard to whether or not Jesus was the Messiah so that Israel as a nation could be delivered from the surrounding nations and then the end times events would kick in at that point. So when we think of repentance, so many bad ideas about repentance. <laughs> We've got a lot of videos where we talk about this. When we think of repentance, we tend to think of individuals turning from sin to God, things like that. And there's a little bit of a mistake in there because the repentance <laughs> in this case is about Israel. It's not, this isn't, in Acts 5.31, it's not an individual repentance about individuals getting saved. And you, So you don't want to read that idea back into that passage in Acts 5.31. Okay? And then when we come over here to Acts 11.18, it's not that individual Gentiles get repentance granted to them. It's that 
the window, the opportunity of repentance is open to all Gentiles. In other words, you don't have to be circumcised or keep the law in order to be saved, in order to repent. Now, speaking of repentance, people think of it as turning from sin in the sense of like turning from wrong deeds. Like I got to quit smoking and looking at porn and quit drinking and quit cussing my wife out and kicking the dog uh, before I can get saved. And if I get saved and I keep doing those things, then I guess Jesus really isn't Lord. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, then he's not Lord of all. Then I guess I'm not really saved, not really regenerated, which means I'm either not elect or maybe um, if I am elect, I haven't been genuinely regenerated yet. So I better go beg God for that. It's a way to keep that lordship salvation stuff is a way to keep people doubting their salvation all the time so that they have to cling. It's, it's adaptive for the organization to make people doubt so that they have to cling to the organization and continue, you know, patronizing it, sending their money, that kind of thing. It's an it's a institutional perpetuation type of memeology that's going on there. <clears throat> so what do they learn? They have learned that you don't have to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised to be saved. What do they do now? Now, huh, they were preaching to Jews only. Now watch what, watch what they do in response over here in Acts chapter 11, on the left-hand side of this visual aid. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So these people that hear this, they immediately put it into practice. Okay? And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number uh, were baptized and had hands laid on and spoke in tongues. No, that's not what it says. It says a great number believed and turned to the Lord. All those requirements that people think are ha having to happen, keeping the law, being circumcised, or whatever else you, you think has to accompany genuine salvation, none of that's mentioned here. Believed and turned to the Lord is good enough. And the tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem. It's a very interesting phrase here. You know that, not what I wanted to happen. <laughs> the ears of the church, like in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the body, some people have eyes, some people have hands, some people have feet, some people have ears, some people have nose, that kind of thing. And this is interesting how it talks about the ears of the church. It personifies this kind of thing like this. In the very next chapter, you have some more, you have another figure of speech like this. We're in verse 22. Hold there. I want to pause and show you. When we get to chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now, does that literally mean... Now, those of us who are, you know, you come from a fundamentalist background, so we believe the Bible literally. That does not mean that the Bible doesn't have figures of speech. So, when it says that Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church... It does not mean that he literally reached out like Elastigirl and just grabbed a bunch of people and troubled them. Okay, He's not reaching out with his literal hands. That's, that's a figure of speech which is referring to the extension of his authority and power where he's dispatching soldiers or whatever else he's doing, to di whatever was within his power and purview and jurisdiction to go vex the church. And the figure of speech is stretched forth his hands to do so. So just because we believe, believe the Bible is literally true does not mean that we don't recognize that it has figures of speech in there that are not literally true. Okay, Herod the king did not actually stretch forth his literal hands to vex certain of the church. He might have actually, he might have actually had a motion. He might have given an order and written it down and had the people who were going to you know, execute the order. He might have had that written down and then when he puts forth his hand like this, with a scepter, maybe that was the thing that made it official or what. There could have been something like that where that figure of speech gets tied to. But he's, he's not literally reaching his hands out to do the vexing. So you see these kinds of figures of speech and these things, these things came to the ears of the church, which is at Jerusalem. So th what does that imply? That implies that the church at Jerusalem has some kind of in intelligence mechanism, some kind of mechanism whereby it receives news and updates its thinking based on the news that it has received. You know, what is the latest information that we've gotten and how are we going to modify our understanding of what's happening based on that news? 
And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So the church at Jerusalem doesn't automatically accept this. Who when he came had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. So he goes up there to Antioch, Antioch, Syria. Let me show you these. Uh, let me show you how far away we are here. Um, where is a good map that I can use? Because I have several maps. This one might be good. Okay. All right. Yes. This is Paul's first missionary journey. We're not talking about that exactly at this moment. But as you can see over here at the bottom of the map, you see that little red dot is Jerusalem right here. And then Antioch, if you keep going up, you will see Antioch up here. So Barnabas gets sent up to Antioch, Syria. Now there is another Antioch in Pisidia, it's over here on the left-hand side, uh, between Asia, Phrygia, and Laconia. But, so you have to pay attention to the context in Scripture to see which Antioch it's talking about. Right now we're talking about Antioch, Syria, which is just north of Jerusalem, kind of pretty much along the coastline here. That's where we are. So Barnabas gets sent from Jerusalem up to Antioch, and when he came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Well, if Calvinism were true, they would they would need no such exhortation to have purpose of heart cleave to the Lord because everything that they would be doing would be predetermined by God anyway, right? And they would just do it. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. I wonder if that means that you could be full of one without the other. <clears throat> Sometimes I click on these little letters and buttons down here and it causes some of these little tools to pop up. And much people was added to the Lord. You'd say We would say much people were added, but the people here is used as a thing that was added to the Lord. Much people was added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. So then Barnabas takes off. Where's the map that I was just on? So Tarsus, I thought I swapped over to it. So Tarsus is right over here. If I were to make myself bigger, I could probably point at it. Uh, <laughs> Tarsus is right there on the map. Okay, so we got... Antioch, and he's like, hey, I've already come this far. Paul's right over here. Let me just let me just go get Paul because you remember they sent Paul away when they thought he was going to be killed by the Jews. So he decides he's going to go over to Tarsus to get Saul, right? And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. I wonder how long that took. You know, you got to go find where this guy is because they just sent him away. Does he have a house? Do people know him? How does he find him without giving him away? to the authorities as a, that he's a Christian and that, you know, that kind of thing. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That's the first time the word Christian shows up in your Bible. And where does it happen? Where does it not happen? That's, that's interesting too. It does not happen in Jerusalem. It does not happen in Alexandria. It does not happen in Rome. Okay? A lot of people think the Roman Catholic Church is the original version of Christianity. There was no Roman Christianity <laughs> until the Roman Catholic Church didn't exist until the 4th century. Okay, So the, the Christianity, the term Christians starts in Antioch. does not start in any of those other places. Why is that important? Well, if you were a, if you were a Judaizer, a Hebrew roots movement kind of person, you'd be fixated on Jerusalem. Well, there's no reason to fixate on Jerusalem. Let's go to Antioch. Antioch isn't even in Israel. And it's kind of interesting that the term, now later on, Peter uses the term Christians in his epistles. So it, it is a term that gets used later. So Peter starts using the term Christians. It's interesting uh, that it's not, it's outside of Israel and it's not in Jerusalem. And it's focused, it's, it's, it's in a Gentile area that this happens. It's, it's almost like a, we're being given a, a signal or a symbol that things are branching out to the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1.8. 
doesn't happen in Alexandria. Rome doesn't happen in uh, Alexandria or Rome, and it doesn't happen in Rome. So Alexandria is where we get a bunch of bad manuscripts from. Rome is where we also get a bunch of bad, bad manuscripts, and a pagan version of Christianity comes out of Rome as well, uh, from which the Protestants later, later split. Meanwhile, the Christians are, have always still been doing their own thing. Um, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, were never part of the Protestants. They're never part of the Catholics to be Protestants. They've always existed apart from the pagan types and versions of Christianity. So there's no reason to be. There's no reason to identify with either Catholicism or with Protestantism if you are a Bible-believing Christian. Bible-believing Christians have always existed separately from these state-joined institutions who... I don't, I don't see how you could think it's even Christian when Protestants and the Catholics were persecuting people in the name of the person who preached forgiveness and love, love your enemies, pray for them, which despitefully use you and persecute you. That is not Christian. That is not Christian. There's, there's no way in which that is Christian. <clears throat> so Barnabas goes up there to validate these things. And we're going to go back. We're going to go back earlier in the chapter and look at a couple of things. But in these days, the prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. So Barnabas is up there. He's been sent from Jerusalem. And I guess he's sending letters back. And it doesn't tell you this, but he's been sent to investigate and check this out and see if it's legit and all this. And I guess he's sending letters back. I don't know. But he's going to go back in person here in a minute. So in these days, the prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit. Now, it's interesting here that, that this word Spirit is not capitalized. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean it's not the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Greek does not have any capitalization. The uh, Greek from around Antioch was written all in minuscules. There's nothing capitalized. The formalized Greek that got you know, upregulated down in Antioch, corrupted, that's written in uncials, which is all caps. So there is no, there are no, like in English, we have capital letters for proper nouns and things like that. That doesn't happen in the Greek manuscripts. It's either all minuscule or all uncials. There's no mix to indicate in the text whether or not something was officially. So they signified by the Spirit. When you see it not capitalized like this, what that means is that the translators do not take it to be the Holy Spirit, but maybe some kind of spirit of prophecy that they have. You know, and what you want to do with that information is up to you. Whatever. I'm just letting you know what these translators thought. If you have a different version of the Bible, they might have it capitalized. What verse was that in? Verse 28. Let's see the ESV. Uh, the ESV has it capitalized. The New King James has it capitalized. The CSB has it capitalized. So it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, the NIV, as if that matters. NIV is an inaccurate translation of corrupt manuscripts. The NASB is an accurate translation of corrupt manuscripts. That's how to tell them apart. King James is, the King James does not have it capitalized, which is thought-provoking. What does that mean? That, uh, you're going to have to consider all that when you're trying to do your hermeneutics and exegesis. But they signified through the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And that's the note, that's Luke the author telling you, and that happened. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So what does this mean? Judea is having a difficult time. What's in Judea? Jerusalem is in Judea. See? Jerusalem's in Judea on the map. So they send relief by the to the elders of the church, probably at Jerusalem. It just says Judea here, brethren which dwelt in Judea, probably in the hands of the church at Jerusalem, by Barnabas and Saul. So whatever is going on at Antioch, I'm guessing, and, and you have to infer that they're probably sending letters back to Jerusalem where some of the apostles still are, 
to let them know what's going on and that their assessment is that it's authentic. And then also Barnabas and Saul go back to Jerusalem here with this relief. And I would, I would presume, even though the text doesn't explicate this, that I would presume that a, a report was given back to Jerusalem about what's going on. Here's what's going on in Antioch. Here, now that the Gentiles can be saved without keeping the law or being circumcised, here's the fruit, here's what's happening, look at all this growth that's happening. It's pretty crazy. Now what the text does not say, to my knowledge, it does not show you Paul, Barnabas and Saul coming back to Antioch, but when you get to Acts 13, they are back in Antioch. Go to Acts 13. So I'm going to back up here. All this stuff was about... Um, Peter winds up in, James gets killed in Acts chapter 12, spoiler alert. Peter winds up in jail and gets miraculously delivered out of jail. And then Herod makes this great oration and winds up getting, you know, killed, struck, stricken down for not exalt, not giving the glory to God. And then Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Okay, there it does say it. I guess I overlooked it. When they had filled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark, and they were in the church, that, which is at Antioch. So there you have them going back. So Jerusalem should now should now be up to date with what's going on with the Cornelius event and with the aftermath of the Cornelius event. Everybody should be on the same sheet of music. Now what we know from reading through the book of Acts is that in Acts chapter 15, there are some people that are not on the same sheet of music. And then there's this big dispute over whether or not you got to be circumcised to keep the law. It comes up in Acts 15. You would think that by the end of chapter 12 here, once Barnabas and Saul had come from Antioch and then they go back to Antioch, you would think that that would settle the issue as far as Jerusalem is concerned, as far as anybody else is concerned. It apparently does not settle the issue because a big controversy uh, spawns up huh, in the middle of Acts chapter 15. And then they have to go handle that. The, the takeaway from this, and I don't know why people can be so dumb and stupid, but they think that people tend to think that the further backwards you go in church history, the more they had their act together. And that is not true. Not even in the book of Acts. People make these stupid statements like, I want to go back to a book of Acts church. Well, what part of the book of Acts do you want to go back to? Let's see. You want to go back to Acts chapter 2 when they don't even know that Gentiles can be saved? Is that what you want to go back to? They don't even know that salvation is by grace through faith yet? They don't even know that. That's where you want to go back? <laughs> you want to go back, okay, anytime through Acts 1 through 7, that's the case. They don't even know Gentiles can be saved. There is no apostle to the Gentiles. Paul has not written any epistles. At all, there is no New Testament. Is that the kind of Acts you want to go back to? Is that the kind of church you want? Or do you want to go back to the Acts 15 church where they some people know that Gentiles can be saved, but there's a whole bunch of confusion and a lot of people are going around saying that you have to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. And there's so much confusion in Asia Minor and Galatia that they have converted all, the, all they which be in Asia have turned away from me, Paul says in 2 Timothy. You want to go back to that part of the church where everybody has in Asia has turned away from the apostle to the Gentiles? Is that the part you want to go back to? Or the part where Galatia is all confused and has to have letters written to them telling them to stop following the law because they're, you know, falling from grace if you're following the law? Is that the part you want to go to? You see, there's, there's a lot of issues in the early church that are not sorted out. And when it's easy, it, you, people gloss over it and they think the further back you go, the closer you are to the truth. They were messed up. <laughs> they had all kinds of things wrong. Peter is messing up, had to be corrected by Paul, had to be withstood to the face by Paul. And he gets called out in scripture for being wrong. And then uh, Peter acquiesces and admits in, in, uh, First, Second Peter chapter three, that Paul's writings he he refers to them as scripture, like other scripture, and they're kind of hard to be understood. But you, this is the thing that you need to be paying attention to. So, which which part do you want to go back to? Where they're still in the full court press to try to get Israel to receive the Messiah and kick off the end times, 
where they haven't yet swapped over to just preaching to the gen or also preaching to the Gentiles, like in Acts thirteen forty six, Acts eighteen six, and Acts twenty eight twenty eight. You know, you you seeing you put this far from you, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. That hasn't happened yet. Which part of the book of Acts do you want to go back to? What what level of confusion from the book of Acts are you idolizing that you think is so great? Okay, they had problems. People call them the church father. They should be called the church babies. And then the churches that came right after that, the first, second century, they had all kinds of problems too. Remember, even in the Bible, you have Alexander the coppersmith, Hymenaeus and Philetus, um, Diotrephes, Demas. You got, you got all kinds of people. And then Paul talks about false brethren in Galatians 2 and in 2 Corinthians 11, talks about false brethren. All this kind of stuff is going on contemporary with the apostles. You think it all just evaporated in the first century after that? Or in the second century? You think all those guys just suddenly, suddenly there's no error and you can just trust any, everything everybody ever wrote? No. <laughs> no. So don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. Remember how much error there is while these events are going on. Not everybody is on the same sheet of music. There are, just like with any organization, you, you, we tend to idolize these people and think that they all have this direct connection to God, they all have perfect discernment, and they all understand the exact truth, and they're all following it perfectly. No, they have to be exhorted. They have to be exhorted that, you know, with purpose of heart, they should cleave to the Lord. And there's, there's things that have to be worked out. And part of the edification process Ephesians 4.16 is the working out of the things. Okay, What do they not do? What do they not do here? With all these issues going on. They responded in Acts 11.18 with, oh, when they heard these things, these are the Jews that contended with Peter. They held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life. And then that was that. And that was the new policy. It was the new thing. We don't know what they're writing down or keeping track of, but I don't see... I think, I think about churches that I've been in. I think about how long, how long in your church does it take to update the statement of faith? What if there was a change of understanding at your church as to who the audience is that can hear the gospel and receive Jesus Christ? What if there's a change of understanding in that? It's pretty significant, right? It has to do directly with the gospel and the Great Commission and who can get saved. So if you had an understanding shift of who you should be preaching to, which is what they had, how long would it take you in your church to update the statement of faith? Or your confession of faith? Some people today are following a confession of faith that has not been updated since 1689. 1689. That's the last time it was updated. Now, the Southern Baptists just updated theirs in 2000, I think. Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And then they've uh, changed a lot of things. It's become more progressively more Calvinistic since like the 1925, the 1961, and all that kind of stuff. It's become progressively more Calvinistic. <laughs> and some people are following one since 1689. And I can't remember when the Westminster Confession of Faith came out, but I think it's somewhere around that time frame as well or the 1700s, something like that. But the, a lot of those are copying from each other anyway. What would it take? Think about that. What would it take to in your church? Think about, the, there's little laws written down about what it takes to update things and the process that it takes. And what would it take to update the bylaws? What would it take to update the church constitution? What would it take to update the hub of where the activity of the revivaling and evangelism was occurring. What would it take to move it from Jerusalem to Antioch, the equivalent of that at your church? What would that take? So there's a couple of ways to look at this. You could, you could infer that all of that bureaucratic stuff is happening in the background, or you could notice that the text does not mention them doing any of that. And that's, that's kind of where I lean with this. I do not think they have statements of faith. I do not think that they have bylaws and constitutions or anything of that nature. 
I think it is a more of a communitas, not a civitas. People want to have a Christianity today that is more of a civitas. A civitas is like a top-down, hierarchically regulated collection of people who all agree to abide by the same rules and authority. Whereas a communitas is people who come together because they are attracted to each other organically based on similar interests. Okay, And I know that there is an authoritative structure, 1 Timothy 3. There are bishops and overseers and elders and that sort of thing in the church. I understand that. But the church seems to be more of a communitas um, in the early, when you're looking at the book of Acts and what they're doing. It seems to be more of a communitas. <clears throat> When I talk about statements of faith, I advocate abandoning statements of faith on purpose. And when people hear that, they start doing cheetah flips. And Brother Melms really does not like this, okay? And people start to feel insecure. You have to realize that your statement of faith, if that makes you feel safe and secure, it is a false safety and it is, it is a false false security, which you should not feel. And people make statements like, well, if you don't have a statement of faith, how are you going to protect people from, you see, protect people from what? False doctrine. How do you protect them from false doctrine? I'll show you how to protect them from false doctrine. What, and then what people are really getting at is control. How do I control the boundaries of what these people are going to do and believe? And we suffer from propositional reduction. In other words, all the four kinds of knowing, we've reduced them to just propositional knowing. And we are unaware of the other three kinds of knowing. And so we have established all of our boundaries are propositionally stated. So we have all these propositional boundaries. That's your statement of faith. And people are considered to be safe or orthodox as long as they stay within those boundaries. And what that does is it prevents us from being able to react to stimuli that are novel. So novelty, we can't react to novelty. Now think about this. God is infinite, right? You can't possibly know all of God. And any, any model that you have of God is necessarily wrong. It cannot be true with a capital T. And if you are beholden to it, it is essentially idolatry. You have a graven image of God in your mind that you are worshiping rather than God. You have to keep yourself open to the fact that you cannot possibly know all of God. So you can have points of interface and lots of them with the infinite God, but you cannot capture the infinite God in your own experience or participatory knowledge, much less propositional knowledge, which is data compression of the other three kinds of knowing. You can't possibly do that. So why do we try? <laughs> why do we try? Um, imagine... A huge sphere. I'm trying to see if I have like a ball around here somewhere. Imagine a huge sphere and you're like a needle point and you can just touch the sphere at any given point at a time. That's, how, that's your interface with God. And arguably there are infinite number of individual points where you can interface with the sphere, with God. And you can, you can do one at a time but you can never get them all and you will die of exhaustion or of old age, before you have a chance to get them all. So most of what is about God, most of what is about God, is something you will never know while you're on this earth, in any of the four kinds of knowing. Now, I advocate that you get to familiarize yourself with as much as possible of God, but to, <laughs> what now what does this mean? What that means is that most of God is novel to you, and it is not something that has been captured for you in anything that any man can write to you. Because first of all, writing is data compression, and even if it wasn't data compression, it's still a single point of interfa interface which cannot capture the whole thing. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that one of the things we need to value as Christians is the capacity to respond to novelty. Because most of God is novel to us. Because he's infinite. We are finite. Most of God is infinite. 
What that means is you have to incorporate into your way of being, your doing, being, and becoming. You have to incorporate into your way of being interface with novelty. Understanding that more aspects of the infinite God will be revealed that will be novel to you. And as you grow, it will have to be through novelty. So if you have a statement of faith that rules out the possibility of encountering any kind of novelty, what that means is that you will not grow. You will not grow. You cannot grow. You think of, uh, I want to do a whole video on this, on like a distributed denial of service attack. And I'd have to explain what that is. But basically the, inter the Logos is trying to interface with you and there's something inside you that has part has come from the logos god created us all that wants to interface back with it your statement of faith your paradigm your ideology the things that you are clinging to that you think are good right and true and secure and make you comfortable that is a denial of service attack attack preventing connectivity between you and the server between you and god it's stopping you from seeing god and the problem is you don't know it because you think god is in the statement of faith you think God is in the doctrine, it's in the religion, it's in the faith that you think you're following. You think God is there. God is not there. Very little of God is there if God is there. God is outside of that. So you have to incorporate a way to get outside of that. You have to. So what's safe? You think your statement of faith is safe. No. The way to be safe is to update the edification model. So you think... <laughs> trying to find a sheet of paper around here. I have this envelope here. You think writing something down on a sheet of paper <laughs> makes everybody safe because everybody understands now their propositional boundaries that they can't go outside. And as long as you put up a fence, the cows will know not, you know, the sheep will know where they can't go and where they can go. Well, what the Ephesians 4 edification model does, instead of putting boundaries around people, treating them like children, we actually upregulate the capacity of the individuals to operate as agents in the arena. So now they have every individual interfaces with other Christians and they exercise discernment and they separate signal from the noise and they, um, <laughs> what's the other word I was looking for? They have, they have more wisdom. They can make better choices. So they're, they're doing being and becoming through this edification process to the point that especially in the edification model the the mesh network topology <laughs> like the way the internet works instead of instead of a one to many mainframe kind of thing you have a peer to peer mesh network topology right and everybody's communicating with everybody else and everybody is upgrading and upregulating everybody else's capacity to participate. So in in the old way, in the legacy way of thinking, you have a real strict statement of faith and that keeps everybody faith. That keeps everybody safe. It's not really safe. <laughs> in the Ephesians 4.16 way of edification, you actually upgrade the growth of the individual's so that they can make good choices and exercise discernment without having to have a set of rules from the outside, from somebody else imposed on them, without having to have a statement of faith. In other words, we really follow Jesus as the way. Following Jesus is a way of doing things. It is not a set of propositional boundaries at all. It's not that at all. So what we see in Ephesians 4, 14, that we be, henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. And that's what, when people think that the statement of faith is going to keep their people safe, what they're thinking is that if they don't have that statement of faith written down, the people won't know what the boundaries are. They're just going to wander all over the place like stupid people. And, and there is a selection process, and this edification process will select for some people versus some other people. Not everybody's going to come along on the journey. But what you don't understand is that by creating propositional boundaries in your statement of faith, making everybody adhere to that, prevents people from growing out of that. Prevents people from growing out of this 
children being tossed to and fro, carried about with every winds of doctrine. So you are perpetuating that if you are in a church that has a statement of faith. You're like, all oh, churches have a statement of faith. Well, then that's a problem with all churches. Okay? That's a problem. It, I'm not the one who wrote Ephesians 4, 4, 14. Okay? I'm trying to point it out for you, to give you something to aim at, something to grow toward. Well, what am I, ha, ha, ha. And what, you're, what are you thinking when you start going into a panic about what you're going to do without a statement of faith? You can't control people. That's what you can't do. You can't control them. And they're going to do things for God that you don't understand. And you're afraid of that. And you're going to feel like you're going to lose your little, <laughs> your, your little piece of the pie of what God's doing. You, you need to up, help upregulate people's capacity to participate in the edification model. Bring everybody up to the level where they could be the one writing the statement of faith. But then take them beyond that to where they have the wisdom to know better than to try. That's where we need to take people. And it's, it's the interconnectedness of those kind of people that we need to work on edifying people toward. People need to be able to speak the truth in love. They need to be growing, doing, being, and becoming up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Notice there's nothing in here in this edification model. There's nothing in here about writing down a statement of faith, a confession of faith, and making everybody learn it, creating propositional boundaries outside of which nobody can you know, encounter any kind of novelty. No, Paul wants them to know and comprehend the length, width, breadth, and height. Think of the four dimensions there back in chapter 3. He wants them to know and comprehend all of that. You can't do that if you're propositionally limited. And we're stupid enough to do it to ourselves on purpose. We do it on purpose. We, we are the inhibitors of our connection to the Logos. We are the, inhibit, we are the inhibitors of our own growth, of our own potential, potential, of our own capacity to be upgraded into somebody who can be part of a whole body that is supplying edification to the rest of the body. Discernment, wisdom, growth, love, speaking, hearing, Transmitting, retransmitting, that's got to happen. Got to happen. And statement of faith is the thing that is keeping, is one of the many things that is keeping Christians from growing into that. Now notice you don't see this over in Acts chapter 11. You don't see them going, it, it doesn't say anything anyway about any, any kind of long bureaucratic process about upgrading and updating all these things. Now, Something else that is occurring to me, and I, I intended to talk about this longer, but I only have like six and a half minutes left for the time that I have budgeted, maybe a little longer than that, because of the beginning. Peter starts talking about this. So these people, um, these Jews, came the circumcision, were contending with Peter, and he says, Thou wentest to men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them, right? And they're, you're not supposed to do that. Right, obviously, Peter even mentions that before. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order to them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. <laughs> now, a certain vessel descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners. And he goes on to explain this vision. Now, this is interesting to me because of all the things in the book of Acts that people want to copy and emulate, it's like people are picking all the wrong things. Instead of seeing the transitional nature of the book of Acts. Instead of seeing all the problems that they had to overcome and the development into the inclusion of the Gentiles and what was necessary to make that happen, instead of seeing the bigger picture and the flow, the zoom out, perspectival knowing, you see? When people quote proof texts from the book of Acts, what they're showing is that of the four kinds of knowing, they don't have any perspectival knowing. They don't know how to zoom out and see the big flow of what's going on. When a Calvinist tries to use Romans chapter 9, what they are telling you is that they are ignorant of the book of Acts. If they think Romans chapter 9 supports Calvinism, that, is all, that constitutes an admission of complete ignorance of what, what is going on in the book of Acts. They have no idea what's going on. They treat the Bible like it's a, like a resource of cherry-pickable proof texts for this ideology that they hold a priori before even approaching scripture to conduct any kind of investigation. They're not looking for an investigation. They're looking for, they're, they're a doctrine in search of a proof text, like Dr. David Allen says, as very well put. That's, that's all they're doing.
it's interesting to me how the book of Acts, if you understand, if you understand what's going on in the book of Acts, you know that uh, then you understand Romans 9, what's happening there. Things are shifting to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles can get saved free, willy-nilly. They don't have to be circumcised or keep the law, and the Jews don't like that. And then the center of gravity of Christianity is shifting to the Gentiles. Jews don't like that. That's what's happening in Romans 9. That's what's being addressed in Romans 9. It's the Jews that are being hardened as a nation. Well, we're not going to get into all that right now. We're going to talk about this trance thing. He's in a trance. So of all the things that people quote as proof texts in the book of Acts, it's funny what they don't, what, what doesn't make it out. But some people do. And when it comes to trances and visions, you see, I have seen two things about this. I've seen on the Baptist side, they can't control it and they don't understand it and they're afraid of it. So it's all demons. You're, you go into a trance and you're opening yourself up to the demonic realm and you might get demon possessed. I know that sounds crazy. I've said that myself. Okay. I've said that myself. So they try to make this dangerous area it's beyond the light, Simba. You cannot go beyond the light. Right. So trances are beyond the light, not part of the kingdom. Don't go there. Visions. Beyond the light, not part of the kingdom, don't go there. Why? Basically because, I mean, they're right there. It's right there, right there in the book of Acts. There's nothing in the Bible that says you should pursue a trance or a vision. There's nothing in the Bible that says you should avoid them. But we do have passages where they happen. What are we supposed to do with this? Is it, so, <laughs> a trance. What does this mean? I looked up the word trance. In the Greek, and you basically get the Greek word for ecstatic, ecstasis, ecstasis, ecstasy. And so you look up the word for ecstasy, and what does ecstasy mean? Ek, the prefix ek means out or out of, and stasis, stasis, stasis is a, <laughs> a normalized continual way of being, like the, like a homeostasis is the way that uh, all of your organs interoperate together to keep your body functioning well and keep you alive. So a stasis is like a, a either a static point in time of something or a normal way that something operates to regulate itself, a stasis. So ecstasis, ecstasy, is to be outside of the stasis, to for your mind to be outside of its normal way of operating. Another way to say this would be an altered state of consciousness, right? Oh, okay. Trance. If you look up trance, you can look it up. It's essentially the same thing. You get some kind of altered state of consciousness. I looked it up in the Webster's 1828 dictionary. And the reason I do that is because that dictionary is probably the closest thing that might give you an insight into what the King James translators were thinking of the Greek when they chose the English words that they chose, okay? I know that 1828 is after 1611. I understand that, but um, that's what Noah Webster was pulling from when he put that dictionary together. So those kind of things go together like that. It can be insightful to look things up in the no Webster, but you get the same kind of thing, basically an altered state of consciousness. The normal way your mind operates is a different way your mind operates. Now, the problem is that that's, um, we don't have a lot of ways to verify altered states of consciousness objectively, huh. objectively outside of subjective experiences. So you have subjective experiences where people are like, I experienced this thing. Here's this trance. Well, I don't know that. And I certainly don't know that that person, while in a trance, would receive information through a vision or something else that would be authoritative or something that you could act on. And it's like there's no way, there's no mechanism built in to rule out the quacks. You say, well, that's where the gift of discernment comes in. And again, you could say that, but it's not subjective. So, what I'm saying is that while it is probably wrong to rule things out as demonic because you can't control it or don't understand it or fear it, it doesn't mean that it's also obviously easy to navigate. So on one end of the spectrum, you have people who just rule it out completely 
stay away from there. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have what appears to be people emphasizing these things to the point of abusing them. And because people abuse them, and because they're not understood, and because they're subjective, it's difficult to write a paradigm that authoritatively and exhaustively incorporates them into a way of operation. Therefore, it's a lot easier just to tell people to avoid them. Those are part of the sign gifts, and those passed away after the first century, after we had our Bible, we no longer had those things. And I understand that line of thinking, and I'm somewhat sympathetic to it to a degree, but we don't have any passages of Scripture telling us that. <clears throat> and and I'm, st I'm in explore mode on this, and I'm, I'm posing this as a question, not because I think you have an answer, but to try to get us all to think together. I want us to think. Trances. Altered state of consciousnesses. What are the ways to get there? There's meditation. It can be musically induced. It can be... <laughs> it can be psychotropically induced. Psy psychotropic drugs. And you say, well, that, you know, a lot of Christians, especially, you hear drugs that have been ruled illegal and you automatically think they're evil and you think it's the same thing as heroin and all this other stuff. But you need to understand these things are very different. Uh, psychotropic drugs can be used and have been used recreationally, but that does not mean that those who have abused them rule out their legitimacy altogether. I've never tried psychotropic drugs. I've been involved in several... I was involved in a VA because I retired from the military medically. And you, they make you undergo all kinds of counseling when you, when you retire medically to make sure the transition process, they don't leave you high and dry out on the street and homeless and all this kind of stuff. You can adjust back to civilian life. So that's, I'm actually appreciative of all that stuff. In that counseling process, uh, and I also went to counseling because of, uh, because of life situations that, you know, those of you who know me, you know that I'm divorced, that kind of thing, trying to avoid all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I was going to counseling, trying to find out what the issue was and how it could stop it from happening. Um, so as I'm going to counseling, one of the things that they, rec they, that my counselor mentioned was that the VA is doing this program on psychotropic drugs. They're using psychotropic drugs to help people overcome PTSD. Well, I did not qualify because I have not been diagnosed with PTSD, but it was interesting how there, it is a legal thing where it's used medicinally. Now, if you are using psychotropic drugs, not, I'm not an expert on psychotropic drugs, so I should probably just shut my mouth. All right. But what I understand from people who have studied this is that you don't want to just obtain them and just take psychotropic drugs. But what people are advocating is that you work with experts who, who first do a lot of self-work, like you need to be at a certain level of honesty with yourself and preparation with yourself, and then do these kinds of things um, in a quasi-religious or in a clinical type of situation where these things are incorporated. So I'm not religiously against any of that, but just trying to make people aware that that kind of thing is out there and that kind of treatment has reportedly helped a lot of people do things like quit smoking or change other habits or see the world differently or become more open. Of the five big personality traits, it causes people to become more open and it causes people to become more altruistic and more philanthropic and things like that. So it's kind of interesting, interested in that. <clears throat> there are some people who also say that psychotropics was a normal part of, like Moses, the burning bush. Some people think that was psychotropics. Maybe what Peter is doing here, some people would argue that there were psychotropics involved in that. I'm not saying there was. I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm letting you know what people say. All right. And I know it's supposed to be super holy to think that everything came directly from God and there's nothing like that involved, but I'm not the kind of person who would rule out God using something like that, the Urim and the Thummim. Nobody knows what that is, the lights and perfections that they accessed with the breastplate for to talk to God and see what God was saying. Some people suggest that there was maybe some psychotropics involved with that. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. But you can use trance to get into... You can, you can use music to get into a trance. You can use psychotropics to get into a trance. And you can use drum beats that goes with music, but not exactly all the same way together. Um, tribes use 
drum beats to create a kind of trance before they do tribal decision making. And um, <laughs> a, a shaman, it's a Russian word, shaman, would sometimes, or many of them use a certain kind of drum beat, a certain tool that causes them to go into a trance and then they go into the spirit world and do things in the spirit world on behalf of their tribe. Now, am I saying I believe all that metaphysically true? I, I have no idea. What I'm telling you is what the narrative is. Um, trances. It's trying to talk about trances. People who have been involved that I know who have been involved in some of our um, charismatic sister and brother churches, they explain these kinds of trances where it's an altered state of consciousness. And it typically is a pleasant feeling. Um, that is an ecstatic, I, I refer to them as ecstatic religious experiences. And I separate the authenticity into two categories. Like, is it possible to have an ecstatic altered consciousness experience? And is it just a coincidence? Like, and is that the Holy Spirit? Those are two separate things in my mind. I separate those two things. I'm, I'm of the opinion right now that an ecstatic religious or spiritual experience is possible but is not necessarily anything that is of God or the devil or anything else. It's just a capability that human beings have uh, that we can experience, kind of like other things that we can experience that are ecstatic, if you follow me. Don't make me say it. <laughs> and then the tendency for people to... So it could be that being the case that the religious iconography and vocabulary is a point of interface for those ecstatic religious experiences where if you think those things are happening and you have the right music and you're waiting for the Holy Spirit to do a certain thing, it is the right mindset to cause this trance to happen also. Um, <laughs> and I'm not advocating for or against any of this kind of stuff, but what I'm saying is that we have Peter in a trance. Does, does that mean that trances are good? Does this, are we being told through the narrative that it's possible to get a vision while in a trance? And if that's the case, we're not, to, we're not told what he did specifically to provoke the trance. We know he was praying, but we don't know, like we see praying happen all the time where there's no trance involved. So it is presumed that either something else happened <laughs> and, you know, could Peter have been doing something intentionally to precipitate a trance-like state? Could he have been doing that? Could he have been meditating or using music or something that the text doesn't tell us in order to get to a trance state? Could he have been doing that to aid in the praying, to make, to make the praying more intense or more of an intense experience? I don't know. I don't know. And then he has this vision. I I personally think that a few things should happen in the, the people who abuse these kinds of things and always start talking about trances and visions should stop. The people who are afraid of trances and visions because they can't control them, don't understand them and uh, are afraid of them should become more open to the idea <laughs> and writing paradigmatic statements of faith that exclude this kind of novelty probably is a bad idea as well. I cannot sit here and tell you, this would be an interesting thing to talk about, but I cannot sit here and tell you what should and should not happen, but it is interesting to me and when you think about following Jesus as the way and of self-development, alter states of consciousness, higher states of consciousness, doing, being, and becoming, could meditation-induced trances or other kinds of induced trances, maybe musically-induced trances, could trances play a role? Could altered states of consciousness play a role in a person's growth and edification to get closer to God? Or could it also be a window to get visions like Peter got to let a Christian know what kind of decisions or actions they should be making in the near future or in the long term future, whatever. These are things I don't know. These are the things that, that most of my Christian life, I've considered these things 
just out of bounds because of all the abuses. People take advantage of these things and they, they abuse the concept. And there's a lot of fakery going on out there, a lot of fraudulent stuff in the name of these things going on. But if you were to put, if you were to somehow, I don't know if you could guarantee it, but if you could somehow more or less guarantee that no fraudulent stuff was going on, but also incorporate this kind of stuff into Christianity, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I'm not asking for your opinion on that. I'm asking for you to think about that. And I know... Remember, I know all of you who are going to make comments. Oh, that's a bad thing, but I, I know all those answers. I've been exposed to them. I used to say them. I used to be the one saying them all the time. You're going to get demon-possessed, all this kind of stuff. I just don't think that's the right way to look at it. So, we're going to, we're going to end with that <laughs> because we're out of time. And uh, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.